pursuing peace and justice in Darfur, next on International Focus. The Institute of World Affairs at UWM and Milwaukee Public Television present International Focus, a global magazine linking Wisconsin and the world. Welcome to International Focus. I'm Robert Sigliano, Director of the Institute of World Affairs at UWM. Despite a May 2006 peace agreement, the situation on the ground in Darfur has continued to deteriorate. Rebel factions have fractured into smaller armed groups, greatly complicating the search for a negotiated peace. Meanwhile, the Khartoum government and other states continue to focus on a military solution, often at the expense of a viable diplomatic track. With violence and displacement on the rise, the international community's current path to peace seems to be leading nowhere. How have current efforts failed, and what cha changes need to be made to bring peace and justice to the people of Darfur? For a practitioner's perspective on the crisis, we're pleased to be joined by John Prendergast, co-chair of Enough, a non-governmental project working to end genocide and crimes against humanity. During the Clinton administration, John was director of African Affairs at the National Security Council, where he was directly involved in a number of peace processes throughout Africa. He has also worked for the State Department, members of Congress, the UN and human rights organizations, think tanks such as the International Crisis Group and the U.S. Institute of Peace. John also was also involved in the making of two recent documentaries, Darfur Now and Sand and Sorrow. He has authored eight books on Africa, including the New York Times bestseller, Not on Our Watch, which he co-authored with actor-activist Don Cheadle. John Prengrass, welcome to International Focus. Thanks, Rob. John, I'm wondering uh, if you could give us a little bit of background on the situation in Darfur. And, and we've heard the pledge, never again, never again. We heard it before the genocide in Rwanda and after, and yet we keep seeing again happening, um, often, daily, in a place like Darfur. Can you, can you help us understand the situation there now? Well, Sudan's a, a complicated state. It's the biggest country in Africa, and, and it's, uh, it's controlled by a small group of people, a military dictatorship in the center of the country. And most of the regions have, in one way or another, rebelled. The peripheral zones, the south fought a 20-year war, the easterners have been at war, the northerners are considering, the far northerners are considering war, and the westerners, the people of Darfur, have, uh, are now embroiled in this massive co conflict. So the Darfurians, the people in western Sudan, particularly the non-Arab groups, felt deep discrimination, felt total alienation from, this, um, from, the, from the central government. And they... Uh, launched a small-scale rebellion in 2003, uh, principally out of the non-Arab groups of Darfur, an Arab and non-Arab, about 50-50 uh, breakdown. And they fought against the police and army units uh, for a couple of months, and the government of Sudan got nervous and said, you know what, we may not be able to defeat this insurgency with our own army, so let's arm Darfur's version of the KKK, this group of militias with a very racist ideology called the Janjaweed. Let's arm them, give them support and total uh, impunity to commit any crime they want to commit with no consequence. And let them do the job for us. Subcontract the war basically to the Janjaweed uh, to, to, to loot and burn and rape and kill anyone or anything in their path. And they did it. 1,500, 1,500 villages have been burned to the ground in this genocidal violence that has been targeted against the uh, civilian supporters of the uh, rebellion. So they've targeted three specific ethnic groups to, to destroy them, either in whole or in part, as the Genocide Convention says, um, in order to destroy the rebellion. So it's a very specific policy aimed at maintaining power by using this tool of genocide to destroy and, and gen Genocide is rarely applied to this kind of situation while it's happening. And so where is the international community now? Who, who, who makes that decision and, and, and what are, how, how do they make that decision? Yeah. You know, it's a hotly disputed legal term. Um, and the dispute arises because um, it's almost, uh, you know, the old Bush line, I looked into his soul and I said, you know, we have to, uh, the Genocide Convention says the, the party committing genocide has to intend to wipe out, to destroy in whole or in part a particular group of people. So many legal scholars immediately draw back from making that kind of an assertion. Well, we don't know if the government of Sudan actually intended to destroy these groups in whole or in part. 
though clearly the evidence is that that's happened, we don't know what their intention was. Therefore, we've got to leave that to an international legal body to determine probably after the fact rather than making some kind of determination while it's ongoing. So that's where you get a lot of legal and uh, other sentiment against using the term. However, the U.S. Congress unanimously passed a resolution in 2004. Uh, as they looked at it, their lawyers looked at it, um, they thought that it was pretty clear that they targeted these three ethnic groups, the four, the Zagawa and the Masalit, three non-Arab groups, and it looked to them like genocide. And then the President of the United States, as you said, for the first time, never happened before, where President President of the United States calls a genocide wh by its rightful name while it's ongoing. So it's an unprecedented action that's been taken by Congress and, and the uh, administration with respect to the Darfur uh, genocide. And uh, But it's still the only country in the world besides East Timor that has called what is happening in Darfur genocide the United States. And uh, under the Genocide Convention, are there then you know, particular actions that are required to be taken or allowed to be taken, and, and have they been? You know, that's that's part of the argument. Uh, I, I didn't join the Clinton administration until 1996, but in 1994, when the Clinton uh, National Security Council was de deciding what to do about Rwanda in the midst of its genocide, there were many voices who were arguing that um, it would indeed legally obligate the United States to act uh, six months after the debacle in Somalia, the Black Hawk Down incident, where American soldiers were dragged through the streets of, of Mogadishu in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a backwater African conflict that no one really understood what was happening, the last thing the U.S. was going to do was to send troops to another one that they didn't understand, and there was no public support for. And Congress was saying, "You better not send one American soldier over there to that place." So. Um, so they didn't want to do it because they felt there was an obligation to do something. But if you read the convention, it basically says uh, uh, signatory states like the United States and a hundred other countries are obligated to do all they can. So it's basically a subjective decision what you can do to fulfill this idea of doing all you can to prevent, too late for Darfur, and to punish. Those are the two verbs that are used to prevent and punish the crime of genocide. So the one thing that we do have at our disposal now, having invoked the convention, is the need to search creatively for uh, tools that could basically provide some accountability, some cost for the commission of the crime of genocide. And whether that's targeted sanctions or support for the International Criminal Court and its indictment processes, or divesting from stocks of companies doing business. There's a lot of different things we can do to create a cost to punish the crime of genocide that haven't yet been tried fully. The, the, um, one, of, one of the uh, barriers, I suppose, that you have to overcome politically, uh, if not legally, it is, the, is the view that, you mentioned that genocide is, a, is an intentional act, but that, hey, you know, Darfur or Rwanda, this is intertribal violence. This is this is this is the chaos between people who have always hated each other, will always hate each other. So why would we want to get involved? Yeah, that's that's that is exactly the line that the perpetrator, in this case the orchestrator, the Khartoum government, wants people to believe. The truth is that people in Darfur have coexisted for centuries, Arab and non-Arab communities. They've intermarried, they trade. They uh, cooperate, uh, uh, they coexist in living, and they uh, need each other. They're interdependent. And so the government of Sudan's effort, and they learned these lessons well from their war in southern Sudan that I mentioned earlier, uh, has been to divide and destroy. So you pit, they've pitted Arab against non-Arab communities by feeding and fueling one small segment of the Arab community, these Janjaweed militias, to attack the non-Arab neighbors to create a cycle of re retribution that will be hard to stop, to unleash the Frankenstein monster, basically, of anarchy or chaos, and then say, see, it's anarchy and chaos, it's not genocide. And so many people's eye has been taken off the ball of what really has been going on to, and looking, taking a quick snapshot of the current situation. And it does look a bit chaotic. It does look anarchic. 
And so uh, the superficial analysis is that this is chaos and genocide. The reality is is that these are echoes of a genocidal policy that focused, its intention was to create chaos through divide and, and, and conquering people who are opposed to the government of, in Khartoum. So once this, this chaotic process is released, although pursuant to, sorry, as you're saying, a, a rational, calculated policy, so how do we turn back? How do we turn it back? I mean, how, how do we begin to grapple with the situation and reverse its 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 progress? Well, the extraordinary thing, you know, and it's almost unimaginable because it seems like it's irreversible. But in uh, southern Sudan, a few hundred miles away, uh, the violence had been just as bad as in Darfur. The kind of divide and destroy policy was per- utilized by the government of Sudan. When they finally signed a peace agreement in 2005, it almost immediate. Uh, surge of people back. It was one of the highest, well, the, the highest rate of displacement in the world. About four and a half million people were rendered homeless by that war, and the uh, hundreds and thousands per per month were coming back to southern Sudan, to back to their home areas to start to rebuild very quickly. So the capacity for uh, bounce back, you know, the resilience of these communities is astronomical. And so I think that although on paper it seems like how could people ever get back together again after this nightmare, I do believe that the the, uh, the demand, the exigency of, of survival, uh, which requires coexistence, which requires a return to in, you know trade and cooperation, uh, will lead people to once again, once that venal external element of the government of Sudan throwing gasoline on small fires. Once that's removed from the picture, I think people will learn, will work again to try to come together in order to survive. So we've got a couple minutes before our, our break, but I want to t- stick on this topic. So, so then, if if you're, you're, you're the, the situation is that you have an intentional policy on the part of the government of, of Sudan, and as you say, through throwing gasoline, they're subcontracting conflict out to this, the Janjaweed. You've got rebels who are formed who are, who are opposing them. So is it then tractable if, if you begin to turn around the government's involvement? Is that the theory? I very much believe that, and, and we have experience of that in southern Sudan when the militias, they did the same thing they're doing with the Janjaweed they did 10 years ago, with militias in southern Sudan, and famously, uh, we saw a resurgence of uh, chattel slavery in, in southern Sudan, which the American government and the U.S. Congress be, and citizens all over the country became very exercised about and did a lot to to respond to. Once that pressure that came, particularly from the U.S. Congress and citizens, uh, was uh, squarely uh, pointed at Khartoum and there was a consequence, potential consequence for their actions. They cut off the aid and support to those militias and very, very soon thereafter we saw an end to the slave trading. All the predictions that this was completely out of control in southern Sudan, these militias would never be able to be restrained and controlled. As soon as you took away the state sponsorship and impunity, then all of a sudden they just melted back into the environment. It's not to say they'll never do anything else again, but certainly that large-scale destabilizing element can be removed once you address the source. And it's just, the source is a major one. I mean, this is not a weak government in Khartoum. They have billions of dollars in oil revenues every year, which they buy arms with, and they buy loyalties, and they buy off uh, figures within communities to create these divisions. And so, you know, once you get... Once you reverse their intentions uh, and restrain the intentions of the the, the government, I think we're going to see a, an end to the genocide very quickly. Well, John, we'll, we'll, we'll take a break, and I want to I want to come back and talk about you know where we go from here, what the situation is. We'll be back in just a moment on international focus. The Institute of World Affairs presents our community with a range of public programs relating to global issues, U.S. foreign policy, and the world economy. For more information about the Institute of World Affairs, call 414-229-3220 or visit our website at www.iwa.uwm.edu. Welcome back to International Focus. We're talking about bringing peace and justice to Darfur with John Prendergast. 
co-chair of the Enough campaign uh, dedicated to combating genocide and other crimes against humanity in, in Darfur and Sudan and in uh, northern Uganda. And I want to talk more about the Enough campaign, certainly but before we end, but, but John, we were talking about trying to reverse now, or at least uh, stem the, 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 the rage of, of genocide in, in, in Darfur. And you, 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 the numbers are pretty staggering. I mean, 400,000 killed, um, two and a half million displaced. Mm -hmm. um, how do we, if you give us a picture of what's happening now, and, you know, I can imagine people just saying, look, there's no hope. So why, why would I, why would, why, if I, even if there was something I could do, why, why would I even want to get involved? So, so what can you tell us about what's happening now? Well, I think there's a really good news on the horizon here. We have a number of variables. First, that there is a movement uh, that has developed in the United States of citizens all over the country which, who are uh, dedicating themselves to uh, opposing the commission of genocide. Um, they are organizing through their churches, through their synagogues, through um, this universities, through their organizations, local organizations, and they're making their voices heard, and it's been heard now very clearly in the U.S. Congress and been heard in the Bush administration. The sh policy has shifted uh, to a much more robust effort to try to end the genocide. You also have that voice, the echoes of our activism heard in China, as far away as China, as their country, which is the biggest investor in Sudan's oil sector uh, suddenly has to consider its international uh, image as it's about to host in 2008 the, uh, the Olympics and wants to present a new face to the world. So they're very, very uh, uh, sensitive to the kind of criticism that's been launched against them for hosting what people are calling the Genocide Olympics. So they will do a lot behind the scenes to get the government of Sudan to stop committing these atrocities. So with the Chinese and the United States, along with some of the new European governments in France and Britain, we have a new president, new prime minister, Sarkozy and Brown in France and, and Great Britain, who have made a very strong commitment to dealing with the Darfur question. Um, you have uh, the makings of an international coalition to resolve the conflict. So things on the ground are getting worse because people are sensing this and they're positioning themselves, so they're fighting, battling for territory. This will get worse for a while, I believe. But as the big, pow as the big powers and the countries with leverage begin to uh, undertake the kind of activities that are necessary to gain the attention and, and change the policies of the actors on the ground, the government of Sudan and the rebels, I think we're going to see a resolution over the next year. Um, so, so the the the, the real politic person will say, oh, but you know, if you've got big oil interests here, you've got you know China. You've got Russia, who has historically been opposing taking action. Um, you know, this this is this this is all sounds. It's pulling at my heartstrings. But but where's the where's the juice on the other side of the equation to to, to bring about the change? You, you would be to allude to some of, uh, to some of that. But but what? How big is that force? Well, the worm already turned. You know, the the Security Council has finally united uh, in a way that they hadn't. The United Nations Security Council voted 15 to nothing. Uh, to uh, authorize a force of 25,000 troops to be sent out to Darfur to protect civilians, protect women from being raped, protect men and boys from being killed, to protect villages from being burned. And uh, that was China playing a very strong role behind the scenes. A number of the Arab countries which were on the Security Council supported the resolution. And the Russians, although they're consider their interest is largely just selling arms, realize the handwriting is on the wall. They never want to be isolated in a situation like this, so they just went along with it. So I think we've finally seen a change, a turn, and that the, uh, the internationals are united enough now to move the ball forward. So that we got the peace, uh, we got this protection force that's going to be deployed over the next few months, and we got a peace process starting at the end of October in Libya that will be difficult in its first stages, but we're starting to, we'll be starting to move forward. So I think that the, the infrastructure necessary to get a deal is being put into place for the first time. It took four and a half years. I mean, it's unconscionable that it took this long. But they wouldn't even be considering doing it if it wasn't for all these activist efforts around the country, uh, the, the, the faith-based and non-faith-based groups that have demanded a certain amount of action and leadership from the United States. One of the other obstacles that, 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 that I've seen in the press recently is the fact that the, the rebel movements have gone from a couple major ones to now... A, two, three dozen groups. 
and, and the, the challenge that poses now for any kind of a negotiated settlement. Is that issue, is there some hope on that issue? Yeah, on the, on the surface it looks really, really negative um, because of this uh, divisiveness amongst the opposition, but you know, there, ultimately when you talk to most Darfurians, there's a few issues that everybody wants to see addressed. You know, they want this John Jui dismantled. Uh, they want compensation for the losses and individual compensation. They want greater wealth and power sharing uh, arrangements so that Darfurians have more control over their destiny in Darfur. These are the basics, you know. And if if the mediation uh, is a, is a, is proactive and uh, inter in presses the issue very hard about what the end state ought to look like, and sells that end state and that vision to the people of Darfur um, in the camps, uh, I think those people are going to say, you know what? They're actually going to do something here, so we need to get our representatives, these rebels, to sit at the table. So I would do it that way. I mean, they've, they've spent in the last six months trying to get these different rebel groups to sit at the table. They're all afraid to do it because they think that this is going to be a cutting of the pie and they're going to lose. So they just stay out and hold on to their guns. But I think if the people that they're supposedly representing start to press them, especially some of the ones that are staying out of the process, press them for being more involved. I think we're going to get. Uh, I think we have a chance of getting a deal. You know, it's just it's going to require creativity uh, and ingenuity in the way that the diplomatic effort is pursued. Which kind of brings us back now to the role of the international community and the role that people, you know ordinary grassroots folks can can play in this. And I know you, you've dedicated a lot of your life to helping make that possible. So could you, could you talk a little bit about? the role of, of these organizations you've mentioned who are forming on college campuses and in communities and in places of worship, uh, the impact they've had and, and can have? Yeah, the remarkable thing is people are realizing that it only takes 10 or 15 minutes a week to actually be part of the movement to make a difference and to try to confront genocide uh, in Darfur. You know, you can join an organization and then you get the action alerts and emails that they tell you what, what you can do every week. You can write letters to your members of Congress or to your senators. Um, you got a great senator here, Russ Feingold, who really has worked uh, assiduously to ensure that uh, that uh, that the United States stands up on these kinds of questions. So uh, others need to be pressed and prodded a little bit harder to 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 be upstanders in these kinds of issues. So you can get involved in divestment efforts. You know, each one of us has mutual funds and pension uh, plans or retirement plans that. Uh, many of us are invested, believe it or not, in stocks that helped to underwrite genocide in Darfur. And you can go onto a website called Sudan Divestment Task Force that can tell you what that, the companies are that do business in Sudan, and then you can check your own uh, retirement fund and see if it does uh, not. And the state of Wisconsin needs uh, to pass a, a divestment bill, so you can pressure state assembly person or state senator to, to push this, this divestment bill. Twenty states now have divested, including Texas and California. Wisconsin could divest. Um, there are plenty of things that people can do, you know, that, that, are, that are really to only take a few minutes. You can write a letter to your, to your local uh, news affiliates, electronic news uh, and, and print, print news, and say, print media, and say, you know what, this is unacceptable that we're not hearing about the 21st century's first genocide, and we want to know what, what you know what, and and it's a supply and demand business. The media, you know, and if people want to hear more about it, they'll just give it to them. There's no problem with that. So uh, we can do a lot to influence things. I think, and uh, as as ordinary citizens, and um, I think people's the biggest fear, or the biggest enemy here is just like just the belief that it doesn't make a difference right. when it does. Well, and and so and toward that end, we've, we've got just a couple minutes left, and I want I want I want you to talk a little bit about the enough campaign and what. What led to you getting involved, helping you start that up, and, and how people could get involved with that? Well, I've, I've been, you know, my, my entire life been working in inside belt baseball, you know, like really trying to figure out how a peace deal can be made and what the policies are needed, and uh, staying at sort of a, a level of an elite level that doesn't have anything. But I've learned more and more that without a, a collection of a permanent constituency of citizens of Americans who are, care about these questions and who demand that the government f focuses on them, will be reinventing the wheel every time something happens, every time there's a major conflict, every time there are terrible human rights abuses, because we don't have 
a regular lobby of people, and we got to develop that. So the last couple of years of my life, I've really focused on helping to build uh, this movement on Darfur because I would like it tra- to 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 it to uh, transform it over time into a broader movement that deals with war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide. Put another way, that supports peace, and um, and I think that enough project, which is what I work for, is a group that is attempting to provide uh, substantive inputs to all of the movement-oriented groups, the the churches and the synagogues and all the organizations that focus on this kind of stuff, the activist groups, and we give them uh, substance to how, you know, what's going on on the ground, what needs to be done, and uh, what the policies are that, that, that may, will make a difference. And so that's it's it's a it's a change because I'd really love to be doing these peace processes, but I also feel without the people demanding that our elected officials do not stand idly by while genocide is committed. If we don't have that, then the thing will just continue. And I'm assuming people can find you on the web easily enough, um, and I hope they do so. So, John Prendergast, thank you so much for for coming to the show, and and we wish you all the best with Enough and and all your efforts. Thanks for having me. To our viewers, we'll see you next week on International Focus.